And we're live with Angular Error. Hello, world. Um, today we're Angular Error. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I told old habits. Yeah, that's old habits die hard, I guess. <laughs> this is not Angular Error. This is JavaScript Error. Angular is cool, and Angular Two Beta was just released, which is kind of exciting. But that's not what we're talking about today. Um, we're talking about JavaScript, and in particular, we're talking about developing and well, learning and developing JavaScript. And so before we get into the show, I just want to give a couple of shout outs to our sponsors who uh, make this possible. So our premier sponsor is Egghead.io, and um, they have a huge library of bite-sized uh, web development training videos. So check them out for content on JavaScript, Angular, React, Node, and a bunch more. Uh, Frontend Masters is also um, a training website. They have um, a recorded expert-led workshop with courses on advanced JavaScript, asynchronous and functional JavaScript, as well as a whole bunch of other uh, front-end topics, so check them out also. And then TrackJS sponsors as well. They report bugs in your JavaScript before your customers even notice them, and with their tele telemetry timeline, you'll have the context that you need to actually fix the bugs. So check them out and start tracking JavaScript errors today at trackjs.com. All right, so um, as a reminder, if you are watching live, you can ask our, us and our guests questions with the hashtag JSAir question. And if you just want to talk about the show, the hashtag is JavaScript Air. And then, um, um, yeah, for our next week's show, just uh, to keep up with what's going on, um, next week we're going to be talking about Babel, the JavaScript compiler. We have a couple of the Babel core contributors on the show that we're excited to have as well. So uh, come and check that out. And then, as always, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Google Plus to keep up with the latest. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce everybody really quick. We have Brian Lindstorff. What's up? And Lynn Clark. Hey there. Matt Zabriskie. Hello. And um, I'm Kent C. Dodds. And for our guests, we have Ashley G. Williams. Hi. <laughs> and Kyle Simpson. Hello, everyone. And Kyle's actually a panelist, too, but um, he's a special guest this time because he knows some awesome stuff about uh, training beginners, and he's always thinking about that, um, and I think that's great. So, great. So let's go ahead and, and get started. If um, Ashley, maybe you could give us a quick intro to yourself and then Kyle. Um, sure. So I'm Ashley. I work at MPM. My official role is developer community and content manager, but I pretty much just like to say that if you don't know how NPM works, that's my problem. Um, right out of college, I was a middle school science teacher in Harlem for three years and started most of my tech career uh, by working and then leading uh, a boot camp in New York City called the New York City Web Development Fellowship. Uh, which basically allows you to uh, allow students who make less than 40k or unemployed to uh, be trained for six months to become web developers. So that's my background, at least in the education world. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't realize you were a, a school teacher. That's great. Um, Kyle, tell us uh, about yourself a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so everyone's going to know me much better online as Getify. So from here on out, I'll just uh, I'll speak of myself in the third person with Getify. I'm kidding. Uh, I have been doing JavaScript now for 16, 17 years. Um, of course, like most people, I didn't really take it seriously for the first like five or eight of those years. Uh, but I got real serious about JavaScript back in 2005-ish and have kind of specialized in it since then. Uh, so I was a developer for a long time and about four years ago decided that I was kind of bored of working on other people's projects. So I wanted to move into a different uh, a different sort of career, a different part of my career track, and that's what led me to teaching. Actually, uh, one of our sponsors, Frontend Masters, a uh, big shout-out to them. I've done quite a few courses with them, but they are actually the platform that gave me my start in teaching. They were the first ones that reached out. Mark reached out and said, hey, I think you ought to come teach, and that's what got me started about four years ago. So uh, I am now a teacher of JavaScript. Um, my role is head of curriculum for Makersquare, which is a developer and engineer training school, similar to other boot camp schools that you may have heard of. Um, we are based in Austin with campuses also in San Francisco and Los Angeles. And uh, so I'm wrangling all things curriculum for them these days. Great. Cool. So I think a, a good kickoff question for us uh, is why do we even want to learn JavaScript? What's so great about 
uh, this language that makes it something we want to learn about. Uh, I guess I'll tackle that first. Why learn JavaScript? The obvious answer is because uh, it has become ubiquitous. Most people have probably heard of Atwood's Law. Anything that can be written in JavaScript will be written in JavaScript uh, eventually. So, so that that is definitely telling of what's happening with our industry. We see lots of move to the web platform, and JavaScript has definitely cemented itself at the center of the web platform. I don't see JavaScript going anywhere anytime soon, even with all the great stuff that's come out in other languages and the transpiling to JavaScript and WASM and all that stuff. JavaScript stays at the center of it. So the most obvious answer is because you're going to need to have some competency in JavaScript going forward to have any place in the web platform. Uh, back to Atwood's Law for just a moment. Just because you can write something in JavaScript doesn't mean you should. Uh, so there's some stuff I heard a saying one time, I don't know who attributed to was, just because you can put JavaScript on a pacemaker doesn't mean I don't want you to put that in my chest. <laughs> so, you know, I think we have to uh, be careful with it, but JavaScript's not going anywhere, and it's uh, never been a better time to deep jump in and learn it. Um, yeah, I completely agree with Kyle. It definitely, it's, it's ubiquitous, but I think when I think about why should we learn JavaScript? I try to think about why JavaScript would be a good language for a beginner to learn. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why. I think one of the first reasons is the fact that you can write it on both the client and the server. And being able to understand both the client and the server and the client-server relationship is super important as a new uh, web developer. It's something that's actually very tricky. And so the fact that you don't have to jump between two different syntaxes uh, in doing that is very helpful. Um, Additionally, though, one of the reasons I like JavaScript as a beginner language is because it, it has a very, very small API. It's, 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 uh, it, has, it has very few abstractions, um, and so a lot of the magic that people often think is delightful for beginners is not present, and therefore you can't fall in its trap. Um, it turns out beginners really don't like magic, and all of that abstraction can really confuse them. And so as a very simple language, JavaScript's great that way. I think Ashley hits on something really interesting. When you say the language, the APIs, the abstractions are small, um, I think some listeners might, uh, that might fly in the reason with some uh, counter to reason for some listeners. But I think it's important to point out that the reason why what you said is absolutely true is because the language itself is very narrow, but there's an awful lot of stuff that developers have to deal with that looks like JavaScript, which actually isn't. For example, most of the ire that people have about web programming is actually directed at poorly designed DOM APIs, for example. The DOM APIs certainly look like JavaScript. Uh, they expose themselves using things that look like objects and functions and as we would with JavaScript, but they're these special host-based things that don't play by the same rules and also aren't developed by the same group that develops JavaScript the language. So when we talk about JavaScript, we have to decide whether we're talking about the language core itself or the broader ecosystem that touches JavaScript, which is all the other stuff that plugs into it. Yeah, one of the first things when I was learning JavaScript that my teacher told me was, um, like, lots of people say that they really hate JavaScript, but what they really hate is the DOM. They <laughs> JavaScript is a great language. It's the, the DOM is what makes developing JavaScript so difficult. And that was particularly true, um, you know, years ago when, before we had a better standards um, idea, and like the yeah, when different browsers, you didn't have to account for the different uh, ways that they add an event listener, for example. Um, so actually, I think that's something else that's that's good to touch on, um, and I want to get your perspective on is what makes learning JavaScript um, maybe a little tricky. Well, I mean, we get right to your point immediately. Like I think also like what Kyle just said is when you say learn JavaScript, what do you what do you mean? Um, if you're learning front-end development and like browser compatibility and the DOM and like those types of things, like that's all like extremely complicated. Um, and a lot of people are like, "Oh, front-end development isn't like real development. That's fake." Um, it's actually significantly harder because you don't get to control where your code runs. It's running in a bunch of different places um, and can behave very strangely. I think when we talk about learning JavaScript, though, if we're learning about say learning programming concepts through JavaScript. Uh, I would definitely say that a lot of people tend to struggle with scope and this. 
like that is very difficult in JavaScript for a lot of people. Um, and like the idea of a closure, I think, is also a very difficult concept, generally speaking. I can go further into that, but maybe we should. I don't know if Kyle, you want to jump in at all, or anyone else. I sure wish somebody would write some books about those specific topics and help people <laughs> figure out. Corey how Fring. Scope closure. Corey Fring has a, an amazing uh, presentation that they did uh, at jQuery, the jQuery Foundation conference last year. I'll I'll put it in the the repo. It's it's good or the nice. the document. <laughs> you could use a repo for our show notes. <laughs> Um, so I would say, um, in addition to there being actual mechanics, which can be, you know, confusing, um, I think one of the biggest reasons that, tr or one of the biggest things that trips people up in learning JavaScript is almost uh, cultural and structural issues. I talk about this a lot in other talks and books that I've written, but I feel like one of the best parts of JavaScript was its low barrier to entry. Um, you can literally write the hello world in one line and you're up and running and you feel empowered. I can take on the world, I can do whatever I want with this language that doesn't require a big runtime to get going, it's just your nearest browser for example. That's one of the greatest parts of the language and to Ashley's earlier point, I think that is one of the biggest reasons why this is the language that someone should learn even if it's their first language to learn. I think it's okay and actually a really good idea for JavaScript to be that language. But uh, that's a double-edged sword. Having such a low barrier to entry, being able to get up and going so quickly, I think has produced several generations of developers now with this mindset that I really only need to know just a small surface area in JavaScript. Some have famously tried to call that the good parts, for example, and not need to learn the rest of the language because, oh, somebody else you know, already looked at that and said that stuff was bad and we should stay away from it. So what got a lot of developers into JavaScript is also what got a lot of JavaScript developers just inside the door, just in enough what I would call maybe competency level understanding. And they were able to have some pretty good early success, especially with the amazing frameworks and libraries that are around in the community, the ecosystem. You can get up and going and you can look like a production quality, uh, even master level JavaScript developer without actually understanding much of the language. So you can get going quickly and because there aren't a lot of other external incentives to do so, you just kind of stop there uh, or maybe just sort of plateau off and your learning stops being about the language itself and more about memorizing the new API for the new framework that just came out today or whatever. Um, and I'm not saying that those are bad things to learn. Those are great things to learn. They make you productive. But I think one of the things that makes JavaScript hard is that if you really do have a curiosity to learn deeper, most of the places that you go within our community sort of hand wave and say, oh, no, no, there be dragons. Don't go into that stuff. Don't learn the coercion. Don't learn this. Don't, don't learn that. Uh, just stick with this framework and you'll be golden. I think we do ourselves and each other a, a disservice by allowing that to continue. So for lack of a better way to put it, that's kind of what my career is about is trying to address that problem and make it so that people do take seriously if for whatever crazy reason you decided to make JavaScript your language of choice, hey, maybe you ought to actually learn all of it. Um, I think that's a really interesting point. Being someone who came from the Ruby world, I saw this a ton. Like We have Ruby on Rails developers, and there are people who don't understand that Ruby on Rails is not a language. Um, these things all infuriate me. Uh, but uh, I, I wonder if if it's not so much that students enter JavaScript, they're able to get up and running quickly, uh, and that they just stop because suddenly they're productive and we're telling them not to do it. I, I think instead that there's there's sort of... There, there's something in the JavaScript community about kind of... There's, there's the people who are doing like open source like JavaScript work, and then there's people who are, uh, I don't know, doing it for their job, and... In the open source world, it's it's about there's a lot of ideas about like not rolling your own framework, not writing things your, yourself, um, and so there's the library writers, and then there, there's almost the idea that you shouldn't be writing it yourself. Um, you should be reusing code, and uh, I think that's something that's very powerful about the JavaScript community. And I'm not I'm not sure if I, I guess I'm, I'm not sure that people think that they shouldn't dive into the language, but that we don't create resources for learning the language. Like, those resources don't really exist. Like, I'd say probably the best resource out there 
is MDN. Uh, and that's hardly a learning resource. That, there's no narrative there. It's basically a dictionary. Um, and so I think if there were more resources, we'd probably see a lot more people doing it. But there's this kind of like Wild West like attitude where you just kind of like find and grab whatever's there. Yeah, Ashley, I was gonna, I was gonna mention. You said Ruby on Rails, and and I always thought that was the very easiest thing to learn when learning programming. Like, here's a perfect environment. It's gonna be object oriented. It's gonna be this. It's gonna be that. And you just do it this way. And like you just the Wild West. It's like what resource tells you how to write JavaScript? Because there's like it's multi paradigm. There's so many different ways you could write it, like a C sharp developer or like a Haskell developer or something, and you end up with this crazy, like, um, you know, you don't know where to start versus something easier. Yeah, definitely. There's, like, a, a huge lack of opinions, I think, in the community. Or it, there's both, like, a lack of a definitive opinion and then, like, a plurality of opinions. Uh, and for beginners, that makes it, like, very difficult to, like, decide which one's correct or which to pick. And so you kind of, like, go the way of, okay, I have this... I am this stack JavaScript developer now, and these are the things that I know how to use, and I just use them uh, because because making decisions in this community is really difficult. <laughs> I think it's a great point that <clears throat> there is a lot of really fantastic libraries and frameworks out there, and you're right, Ashley, that people do stress the idea of not reinventing the wheel, not building your own from scratch. Um, and uh, I think I have a little bit of a reputation for being sort of the, the grouchy anti-framework guy, but it's not because I think frameworks are terrible. Actually, there's a lot of really intelligent work that's been done on the frameworks, but one of the things that I dislike about the framework, again, going back to that notion of a double-edged sword, if a framework does its job really well and abstracts away the details from you and makes it so that you don't have to know how it works, there really does need to be some other external factor that will ever push you to actually understand how it works. Not just that it works, but how and why it works. And I think a lot of people, especially those maybe that aren't so much in the open source community, but maybe more just doing spec work, their boss hands them a feature, they build it, and they go on to the next thing. If, that's your, if that primarily defines your career and your experience with JavaScript, the best thing that you can do to advance in your career is to be really quick at using other people's work to get your work done quicker. So you need to be really adept at finding the right library and the right framework and plugging it together. And there isn't a lot of motivation in that structure for you to learn how it works. I saw a talk years ago, and I now, now I understand that it's actually a book, and I'll put a link to this, but it's called Build Your Own Angular JS. Well, now that Angular 2 is out, I guess it's okay for us to talk about Angular 1, rebuilding it from scratch, but Built Your Own Angular was, was fascinating because what I assumed when I first was going to watch that talk in a conference was that the message was going to be, uh, you don't need frameworks, you can do it yourself, but actually the message was much more productive, and I believe this is true of the book as well. The message was, if you're going to use Angular, wouldn't it be a really good idea to understand how Angular works under the covers? So let me just show you that it's not actually magic, it's not actually a black box, let's build up from scratch. Uh, any listener that's listening to me right now, I would encourage you to check those sorts of things out. Open up the source code for the things that you use and be a little more curious about them. So I'm not saying don't use the framework, but I do want you to understand how it works and never treat something as purely a black box that you couldn't possibly understand. Yeah, I could not agree more. Um, and I know that, that you've seen this, but I've been giving a talk this year uh, called If You Wish to Learn ES6 from Scratch, You Must First Invent the Universe, which is a play on a Carl Sagan quote, which is basically saying exactly what you just said, which is kind of if you want to understand something, you need to start from scratch and build it up. Um, and so there's a uh, an awesome CS pedagogy professor named Peter Van Roy. Uh, he wrote a book called The CTM. And basically it's kind of this idea of creative abstraction. He has this kernel teaching approach where you literally start from nothing and you build every abstraction that a programming language would need um, from scratch and only building that abstraction when you feel the pain of its absence. Um, I think too many times we believe that the sugar that we have in languages, the magic, is what makes something easier to use, but beginners actually like find it, I, I've seen beginners get tripped up by it multiple times, and they feel much more in control when they know what's going on with something. Like I give the example of a for loop, and um, 
an each loop in Ruby, and each uh, abstracts away the three things that define iteration, state, condition, and increment, whereas in a for loop, they're immediately exposed by the syntax, and it turns out that for learning iteration, students do much better learning for loops than they do with using the abstraction each. Um, so yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Kyle. Like, if you're using a framework, it's 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 imperative that at some point you you look under the covers and figure out how it works because you really can't wield it uh, appropriately until you understand the implementation. Yeah, everything's great in the in the happy path, but as soon as you get off the rails, so to speak, as soon as things start to fall apart, you like that. One one last thing um, on that exact topic. There's another project which is very similar to what you just mentioned, Ashley. It's called From NAND to Tetris, NAND as in the NAND gates inside of your CPU, from NAND to Tetris, building computers from first principles. Highly recommend that people check out that uh, book and that set of learning resources as well. I think that it is super important to get under the covers, and I think that you can do that uh, not just by building it yourself, but also by explaining it to other people. Um, so for me, Code Cartoons has been exactly that. Um, you know, going through Flux, going through Redux, going through Relay. Uh, basically, I've been tracing through all, you know the whole, all of the code and then figuring out how would I explain this to somebody else, and that's how I actually start understanding it myself. So I think that that for people who uh, are more you know uh, who don't feel yet confident enough to build their own Angular One as a way to understand Angular One. Um, really getting nitty gritty deep into the interactions in the code base itself, not just the uh, API, but the uh, interactions between the components that you aren't seeing, that can really help you. I think that's yeah. a general principle for all of learning, that what really solidifies learning the best is when you re-explain, when you re-teach to others. 100% agree with that. From the ground up, you need to be looking for ways, whether that's writing blog posts or giving lightning talks or giving brown bag lunches at work or uh, making an open source project or any, any of a dozen other ways. If you turn around and say, hey, I think I just learned this thing, but can I show you what I just learned? You will learn it better and they will learn it better. Uh, teaching is really the only way to learn. Teaching is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your understanding is. That's how I like to say it. That's good. Um, but it's funny, when I think about when I was teaching myself JavaScript, um, I actually, the, the way I did it is, I, I was reading through Eloquent JavaScript by Martin Haverbeek, and uh, I was building, it started out as like an alarm clock, I guess, and then I started building like basically a morning simulator to see, based on how many times I hit snooze, uh, if I would get to work on time. But what I would do is I would write a prompt to some, I, I basically wrote it as if it was a class for somebody. <laughs> and so I would like write a prompt and then I would like write the things that you would have to do in order to code it. And then I would give like the boilerplate code and then I'd write the answer code and then there'd be the next step. Um, and it was just like a super fascinating way and I feel like each part of that was like reinforcing something in the learning and so also when I look back at it, I mean I look like kind of a crazy person but it's, it's interesting. I ended up writing my own test frameworks. I didn't know test frameworks existed. I don't know. It's very funny. Does that still exist? That sounds like an it's awesome It's actually project. on my GitHub. I put it there. I'm embarrassed. Uh, it's called Rise and Shine. All my stuff's public. I'm going to sound like, again, it's, it's a little loopy. I was definitely writing it at like 4 a.m., but uh, it's there. <laughs> you know, all of this stuff that we're talking about makes me think of Dan Abramoff's lessons on Egghead.io about Redux. If you haven't seen those, I recommend you check them out. But one, one of the things that he does in there that I think is just so valuable, um, and like it has, this principle has nothing to do with Redux. The principle is um, he teaches you um, about uh, like a, a concept about some abs like some concept and why you need an abstraction, and then he shows you how to use that abstraction, and then he shows you how that abstraction works, and he, he rewrites it just right there in front of you. It's it's really really impressive, and maybe you couldn't do that in an egghead lesson about Angular, um, maybe for different parts, but um, I think that was just a really Im impressive way to teach, and I, I feel like I could write Redux right now, um, and. Like, that's pretty cool. And if only I thought of it a year ago, then it would be me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, yeah, he, he teaches in a really effective way, and I think that's an effective way to learn as well. I, I find, uh, like, as a counterexample, though, that when 
I try to show, like, here's an implementation of a monad, for instance. People are like, whoa, whoa, I just want to know how to use it, and now you're showing me, like, all these things, and I'm really confused. And it's like, sometimes it's better to hit hit something from, like, ten different examples to gain an intuition than to pick it apart and show the pieces and the implementation. Um, but I, I don't know. It's, it's like, where do you draw that line? Yeah. Well, that's, that's just because you busted out that word monad. <laughs> Anybody that hears the word monad is automatically going to get a little bit scared. Totally I mean, to, I, I uh, think maybe just as a monad. I think the key is balancing motivation, and I mean, this is also why JavaScript happens to be a kind of great language for learning programming because you can get something that looks like something in the browser right away. Um, so one of the things with that CTM book is again Peter Van Roy is having people like build things up from a kernel and like. There's not many people who are going to start doing that that are going to like really stick with that because they find it satisfying. Um, and so what I find is you have to, all learning is goal driven, right? You have a goal and so often people who are learning they want to do something. And so as long as you can keep what you're doing very clearly like on track to the thing that they want to do, you can get as deep and hairy as you want in the weeds as long as like they can that connection still is maintained. And so there's always like a circling back to and this is how this gets you what you need. Um, and so I think like monads are awesome and there's lots of ways to motivate people wanting to use monads. Um, I think probably one of the big reasons people are freaked out by them is they have no idea why they're useful. Um, so if you if you keep that in mind, uh, pe people could get excited about all sorts of things, like no matter how deep and dense or like close to the metal it might be. I think there's a there's a thing in teaching. I don't know um, how many have heard of this term, but cognitive overload theory, this notion that when you're teaching something, when you're learning something, there really is everybody has sort of a level at which beyond that, not only are you not catching anything, but it's really it's almost subtractive you're losing out on the understanding that you thought you had. So as a teacher, you always have to be careful and mindful of that idea that what I'm teaching can't uh, fill up the cup so much that it's overflowing and they're losing. They've tuned me out. They're not hearing anything that I have to say. So <clears throat> on this notion of like building from the ground up, I'm not sure that that is necessarily the most healthy thing. I think it sh we, should, we should want to inspire people to be curious enough that they could but I think more practically, you might go in the opposite direction. Instead of building from the computer's first principles up to an Angular application, maybe start with an Angular application and go one layer down further in the abstraction stack and understand that one. And if you get to the point where you are pretty comfortable, uh, a mastery of that level, get a competency level of the one below that and the one below that. So maybe going in the opposite direction where I'm not really showing you the entire way that the sausage is made, but just that last step before the abstraction. I think that that sort of curiosity is what will foster deeper learning. I, I think that actually kind of applies to the way that I have learned. Uh, I, I started out doing JavaScript just a couple of years ago, and we were doing Backbone, and then we migrated to Angular. I had no idea what was going on, and so I... Um, I got to know Angular pretty well, and then I'd run into a problem, and I'd have to dig in and, and debug Angular's code and whatever. And you know, over time, you kind of you figure it out. But I, I think what's what's key is having um, the curiosity and uh, the desire to understand how does this thing accomplish what it's doing, um, and how could I do it without um, that. And so. Um, like building apps that are vanilla JavaScript apps, uh, just as like toys and stuff on the side, I think is really valuable for your learning um, and and being curious as to how uh, the framework that you're using accomplishes its stuff. Because like we've got to ship stuff, so you know like um, having a framework, I think is is totally valuable in like a work environment where you're building stuff. But we also want to be able to use these things more effectively, and so. Um, you you can use them more effectively when you understand how they work. Um, and so there's kind of the, that balance that makes it kind of difficult. But Yeah. Just to jump back quickly to what Kyle was saying, I do think that, like, you can go in both directions, and obviously depending on the type of person you are, one way might work better for you or, or not. But one thing that I have seen, particularly with web applications, and the reason that I kind of like to start from first principles as opposed to an application, is that an application is oftentimes, especially for beginners, not something that they understand, 
So if you start with the application, you're already starting in a place that is super confusing and disorienting. Whereas if you start from first principles, then first principles doesn't need to mean like uh, how the, the computer works or something, but something more like I have this type of information and I need to like show it in a template, first principles. Um, because once you start from those things, it's, it's significantly easier to understand that as, like, as a human being, I can reason about how an app works, and now I just need to figure out how to implement it. Whereas if you start from the application itself, I find that beginners are often trapped in the way it was implemented, can't think outside of it, and also can't think inside of it. Um, and so it's often not a, a terribly great place to start. Um, of course, if you once you have people who understand how a framework works, then moving down and explaining ab abstractions that way, I think, can be really great. But for beginners, they they just get stuck, and all they see is syntax and have a lot of trouble reasoning about it. Also, there's a lot of really terribly written applications out there. So if you use that as your basis for learning, you have to take that with a grain of salt. Honestly, debugging bad code is a great way to teach. I've actually found um, it's 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 really nice to to because beginners are often afraid of making mistakes. So being able to show like examples of mistakes and then how to fix them, um, I think, is often like a more successful exercise than like the blank page, like having to write something from scratch. Um, the debugging actually ends up revealing a lot more about how something works and writing it often. Speaking of debugging, I hope everybody listening is well familiar with the developer tools in your browser. You would be surprised how many times I run across developers that have been at it for a long time and have barely any understanding beyond a console that there is such a thing as developer tools. So if you haven't learned those, um, this holiday season would be a great time to up your skills in developer tools, whether that be Chrome or Firefox or whatever browser. Uh, there's tons of uh, fantastic stuff about that. I'm actually hoping to do some code cartoons now that I've joined Firefox's developer tools team uh, about developer tools after I finish my React book. So hopefully that will help. Spoiler. It's really funny being a, a back-end person hearing y'all talk about uh, dev tools. I mean, I do some front-end development, but debugging tools in Node in the Node ecosystem right now are actually really, they really kind of like don't exist. They're not very good. Um, so it's funny to talk about dev, dev tools in that sense. Uh, it's like, oh, learn how to use console log. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't know. That, that can be interesting. I think when you're learning as well, I think one of the hardest things getting up and running with programming is understanding your environment and your tools. And what's fascinating to me is that a lot of beginner resources skip that part, where that's the part where we lose 80% of people trying to learn how to code, is like, how do I set it up? How do I like install Node? How do I uh, get going? And so the low barrier of entry for JavaScript, it just being like there's a console in your browser, it's like really nice. Um, but if you want to do anything more, I think also having a lot more resources on how to set tools up, uh, how to set your environment up, and that type of thing is really important. We skip it all too often. I don't know if this exists, but hearing you say that makes me think we need to have a resource for learning JavaScript that does nothing but um, list all the different types of exceptions and error messages that can happen and tell you where the hell those come from. Uh, like, for example, that that famous one that everybody's seen for a million years, undefined is not a function. Thankfully, Chrome finally changed that. But undefined is not a function. It doesn't mean anything to anybody uh, unless you've already seen it a million times. So we should have a resource that like lists what those things are and how to start figuring out from the error message how to go backward using developer tools in whatever environment to go backwards to find the problem. We still get survival great. mode. <laughs> you have to survive as long as you can. <laughs> Yeah, it's like a more helpful version of Stack Overflow because Stack Overflow has all that information, but it's really hard to find it without you know just with Google all searching. the snark and the jerks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> so actually, uh, I, well, I got a question for both of you. Uh, as you teach JavaScript, um, so like I'm I'm kind of along the same lines as Kyle. Like I learned JavaScript like 15 years ago, and the language was much simpler back then. Um, and I thought that was like kind of a good entry level uh, language just because there wasn't so much to try and get your head around. Um, as we introduce new stuff every year with like ES6 and now ES7, how does that affect teaching JavaScript to beginners and how does that affect the way they comprehend it? Because I know developers that have been doing JavaScript for years and the first time they see an arrow function, they're like, oh, what the heck is this? It looks so weird. Um, so I guess my question is how does ES6 affect how you teach JavaScript? 
have you seen my talk? <laughs> I give a talk on specifically this topic. Um, I guess to, to, to summarize what I say is it's we I think one I think we need to be a lot more careful about the way we're extending JavaScript. One of my biggest critiques of the class keyword in JavaScript is that teaching it will be a nightmare um, because it completely obfuscates the underlying implementation and what, how the language actually works. And if we understand that programming languages are tools to teach programming concepts, um, we have some conflict between the concepts and the syntax, which is a big problem. Um, as far as these things that we're adding to the language go, like the, my main thesis is that we need to continue to teach JavaScript exactly the way we've been teaching it before uh, in its limited in the, in, the, in the small language that you learned 15 years ago. And this magic that we now have is magic, and we sprinkle it on top once we've got everything else baked. Um, and so this will be a problem, though, as uh, beginners enter the industry, and they're already going to be seeing code that's written with these new, um, like the arrow function, some of these, these new features. And uh, again, I, I think we need to, to start from the, the basis and just like work the, work the way up. I don't think we should be teaching class or arrow or generators like as first class citizens um, when we're teaching beginners. Yeah, I um, I did I did watch your talk and actually since that's been brought up, that is actually uh, that event where she gave that talk is uh, I also gave the closing keynote. That was the opening keynote. That was the closing keynote for the Thunder Plains conference in Oklahoma City. Big shout out to the Oklahoma City JavaScript uh, community. They're fantastic. Um, but that's how Ashley and I first met, and what prompted us to do this particular podcast episode was uh, some conversations that we have here. So she did. It is a fantastic talk, and, and Ashley's, Ashley's spot on that there are definitely some ways that we can take the new shiny stuff and actually put barriers in front of people to understand. And one of the reasons for that is that I think there is um, some misconceptions among developers about what it actually means to have readable code. I think a lot of people think that's purely subjective, purely opinionated to call something readable. But it turns out it has actually been more formally studied, this notion of code readability. What would it actually mean for a piece of code to, to be perhaps um, scorable in an automated way? Is there a metric for code readability? There's a paper written about this. I'll see if I can dig up the link for the show notes. But there's a paper written about code readability. And one of the studies that, or one of the outcomes from the studies that they did was that one of the biggest things that leads to people calling something readable is actually familiarity. And if you think about it, familiarity is actually based upon this principle of tribal knowledge. It's, uh, there's a special set of stuff that I've already learned, and because I already know that, I can look at this piece of code and it's totally familiar to me and I will call it readable. But if I don't have that tribal knowledge and I look at your code, no matter how readable you think the code is, another person without that shared familiarity isn't going to find that readable. So I think that there are definitely some things about ES6 which are uh, being touted as this is objectively more readable code, but because there are some paradigms introduced that don't actually exist in other languages, uh, we don't have as much of a chance for a developer to show up at JavaScript with that shared tribal familiarity. And that is going to harm the readability of code. Now, <clears throat> I have to just take a side note and rant on class since I actually brought it up. Um, class, for example, is a perfect example of trying to layer on additional syntax to fit a particular predisposed mindset. I show up at JavaScript with lots of thinking about class-oriented design, and I want JavaScript to service my desire to do class-oriented design. So we keep trying to put more and more of the syntax there to look like it does in other languages, and in the places where it doesn't behave like it, plaster over that with as much uh, you know, silly putty as we can. The problem is that it is actually making things harder and harder for someone like me who doesn't just teach how to do the thing, but how the thing works. Um, there are more and more exceptions being added to the language to service all of that silly putty. And it has gotten to the point where I personally don't feel like I'm even going to teach the class word. Not that I'm going to talk about it and then just move on, but I, if I can't teach how it really works without completely losing people, um, then I'm not going to teach just what it does. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not a fan of that direction language. But on the other side, uh, 
there are things that the language has done which are really important and I think actually will aid in uh, learnability uh, of the language itself. For example, I'm a big fan of destructuring. Now, I know the destructuring feature itself yes. is actually <laughs> fantastically complex. There's a lot of nuance to it, and I still am learning parts, you know, different nuances of it. But I think destructuring actually does something really useful with our code, which is that, that it turns our code from being uh, more imperative into being more declarative. And it has been proven, not just a theory of mine, it's been proven that declarative structures are easier to learn. Instead of telling you how to do a thing, I just want to tell you what I want, and I want you to give me that thing back. And that's what destructuring is actually doing for the language, is allowing us to declare what we want to have happen out of these destructured assignments and let the language take care of some of the nitty-gritty imperative work to make that happen. I think that's really important. Um, not, that we can't, not that we can't or shouldn't tell them, here's how we did it before, but I think uh, over time, it will become the preferred way of explaining how to deal with that idiom. So I think ES6 actually did a fantastic job with stuff like that, and then they got a little bit drunk on uh, special operators with things like arrow functions and, and other things like that, and didn't actually really move the ball forward in terms of learnability, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, we had not talked about this before, but I like that we have similar views on ES6, Kyle. That's so funny. Destructuring is one of my favorites. Um, and to, to talk a little bit about, about what you mentioned there about programming paradigms uh, and declarative languages, uh, I, I think that's super important. And again, when we, one of the reasons that JavaScript is a great beginner language is that you can write lots of different paradigms in it. It's very much a multi-paradigm language. And I think... Too often when we teach programming, we focus on syntax, we focus pretty much exclusively on like imperative style programming. Uh, but when we, when we teach with JavaScript, we have the option of being, again, able to teach programming languages as tools to solve problems. Uh, and declarative, declarative languages in particular are something I'm personally really excited about. I'm actually implementing a declarative language right, like DSL on top of Node right now. Um, but we, when you can kind of understand that, it's the, that when we do imperative programming, we have a conflict uh, where we have, we're mixing both our implementation and our business logic. And when we do something with declarative and uh, we have solvers, then we can have our business logic and our declarations, and then we can solve them imperatively. Uh, and I think that that's really great. And again, this is a perspective on programming and what programming is that we could teach when we teach programming, but we often don't. Um, and when we can... We, when we can view programming as this kind of tool, um, I think our relationship with it can be very different. Um, I think yeah. I think you're hitting on something important because um, what 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 is underlying what you just said is a question of why do we write code, and I think an obvious answer that might quickly jump to most people's minds is, well, I write code to tell the computer what to do, but actually, I don't think that's really the primary purpose for writing code. Um, there's two observations. I've, I've been quoted as, as saying this many times. So there's two observations I can quickly make about that. The first is that computer science tells us that there's an infinite number of programs that can solve the same program problem correctly. There's an infinite number of ways to write the program that solves your problem correctly. And then within that space of correct programs, if we talk about just JavaScript, uh, the code that we write is actually just a set of suggestions to the JavaScript engine on what it ought to do. It's almost declarative in that sense that the, we write a for loop and the JavaScript engine is like, okay, I see what you want to do, but I'm going to do it an entirely different way. This is so there important. Is a, there, there is a separation between what we write, and, and, and that's difficult for me because I'm a craftsman. I'm like, I, I chose to do plus plus I instead of I plus plus, and the language is like, well, this other way is way better. You know, I'm glad that the engine is better at writing efficient code than I am, but it is difficult to separate um, and think that the code that I'm writing is precise sets of instructions. But anyway, if we, if we back up from those two assertions, it, it really does ask, what is the purpose of code? If it's not, if there's an infinite number of ways to do it, and the, whatever way I pick is just a suggestion to the computer anyway, then maybe the purpose of code is something different, and I contend, as many others do, that the purpose of coding primarily, first and foremost, and as a far distant second, the computer, first and foremost, human beings. It's a form of communication with other people, which is why I think it's so important that we not just figure out how to teach people a way to get a correctly running JavaScript program, but how we, that we teach people how to write 
an understandable and learnable JavaScript program. That's where we move beyond the skill and the craft into almost an art form. And I don't mean to get like, you know, code is, is poetry or anything like that. I'm not trying to be, you know, frilly about it. But like, I do have in my mind that there is a lot of different ways to express the same program. And if we were to judge those different ways, those different expressions of the program based upon how easily a person with no prior knowledge of the problem domain or the code could understand it without explanation. That's what I call almost self-teaching code, code that teaches itself, that explains itself. And yes, code comments can help, and yes, variable names and functions can help. But this deeper stuff, like uh, what idioms we choose, do, is this appropriately done with a for loop versus a recursion, or is this a destructuring thing that needs to be declared that way? What we choose to do affects how people will understand our program, how they will learn our program. And it's not just other people on our team, but our future selves. When I go back to code that I wrote a week ago, I'm like, what in the hell were you thinking? No, 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 literally, what were you thinking? Because I actually don't know, because I can't tell from this <laughs> what you were thinking. I mean, it's what Ableton and Sussman say, right? It's like programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute, yes. right? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's not a unique idea to me. I'm just... Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I think it's super important. And when I started really getting into programming language design as kind of like a hobby, uh, I started out by being pretty hung up on this question of what does it mean for a language and then also a program to be expressive? Like, what does expressive mean? And I, I would, like, ask people this at, like, meetups all the time. I just go up to them and be like, so what do, what do you think it means for something to be expressive? What makes a language expressive? Um, and generally speaking, the thing I heard was being able to do something in the least amount of characters, um, like the least amount of syntax. I know. I know it's terrible. I was like, I am trying to get at something really beautiful and important here, and you're just talking about you have a language that has sugar so that you can write something really, really short. Um, and so I think trying to move the community towards an idea like when we say expressive, we're not meaning how quickly you can get something done, but how you can, like, really show intent and thought in what you are writing um, is what's important and is what, what makes languages, uh, I think, either better or worse or special, um, is, is how, how well they, they can help express what you're trying to do. Since you're at NPM, I have to tease you on this. Obviously, semicolons hurt the readability and understandability of code. We need to remove all semicolons, right? Um, that was not a decision that I made. Uh, I I have no comment Sorry, I on that. Resist. No, 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 it's I fine. It's fine. I mean, style is important. Like, the one thing I will say is, like, as far as style goes in expressibility or in the expressivity of a language is you want it all to be the same because the key thing that we want to do, and this is why frameworks and stuff are very great, is we want to take away all the boring problems so that we can focus on the interesting ones. And so being able to bootstrap things... Um, being able to like eliminate style. I mean, this is why declarative languages are great. We don't need to tell the computer how to solve things. We just want to focus on our interesting problems and not the things that pretty much we spend all of our time as developers doing, which is like repeating this like kind of boilerplate stuff that everyone has already solved done again. Yeah, it's um, that's a very interesting notion of what what is the difference between the boring, mundane work and the interesting work. And I would um, almost, uh, you know, it's that one man's trash is another man's treasure. One man's uh, or woman's boring code might be somebody else's really interesting code. Um, but I do think it is important for an individual developer to say, this is the part of the program that I'm going to be most effective at applying my brain power to and figure out what tools can help me not worry about that. I hope that people will find, uh, and maybe this is the, the takeaway from my portion of this podcast, I hope that people will find that actually the language itself is a really good tool for that. Understanding the language itself and knowing how to use what's already built in in more effective ways is actually one of your best tools at that. When you don't know much about the language, you just reach for the nearest, most familiar thing, and you end up doing stuff that is the hard way. So I hope that don't, people don't always think, I have to find some other framework or library to do that for me. Sometimes we can just learn JavaScript better, 
and in the in the process of that end up creating more understandable code. Oh yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, this is uh, like kind of like a nesting doll like of abstraction situation, and it's like which abstraction do you want to start with? Which one is the one that's going to be most interesting to you? And there's a kind of a question here about like what's what's to learn next for those intermediate programmers. And um, I would definitely say like take a look at the tools you're using, whether the tools are a language, JavaScript, or a framework, and then like pick. I would say like pick like a couple of the abstractions that you've taken for granted in that, and like dive deep into those and find out how they are working. Um, you know, lift, lift the curtain and see how, that's, how that works. Uh, and that can be really cool because when you do that, you end up getting the, the skills that you would need to be able to build abstractions of your own because when you don't know how the abstractions work, you are kind of beholden to the ones that other people have made for you. Um, whereas once you start understanding how to build them for yourself, you can see a whole new world of like different types of abstractions uh, and be able to contribute those back. Cool. OK, so this has been such an amazing episode. I wish that we had more time. Um, unfortunately, we don't. So I'm going to wrap things up here. Thank you so much for coming on. Let's let's go ahead and take a look at the hashtag and uh, JS Air question really quick. Um, we have we do have a couple of questions on here. So uh, Marcus Nielsen says um, this is at Jetify. Um, object composition, prototypes, pure functional reactive programming. What paradigm should we use in normal projects? I don't know what normal is, but there you go. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's super super hard to answer in a generic way. Um, uh, so, for example, you could think about um, procedural programming, functional programming, and uh, class-oriented programming as three major paradigms. Certainly not the only ones, but as those three major paradigms. And I have to be honest with you that the vast majority of projects that I've ever written, that the most effective parts are the parts that mix the best parts of those together. So I don't feel like I've ever written an entirely object-oriented or an entirely class-oriented or even an entirely functional programming-oriented project. Um, I have a, a, again, shout out to Front of Masters, I have a class called Functional Light Programming. And basically that's taking some of the, the real basic simple principles from functional programming, separating themselves from some of the perhaps uh, overwhelming terminology and just talking about the fact that we can deal with values as if they don't change and we can deal with functions that, that don't have, we can make functions that don't have side effects on other state and those are things that actually improve my code even if I'm writing a class oriented program or if I'm writing a, uh, you know, an object a procedural based uh, code program, those are things that help regardless. So I would say find the principles, those first principles in each one of those paradigms and figure out how those work together. Uh, you're not going to hear me likely say uh, do all functional or all class or anything like that. I just want to jump in and quickly say that the desire to do something in a purely one way or the other thing and to have a simple, an like a one answer for all things is I would say try and get try and rid yourself of that desire because that desire is it's, it's not how the world works. Um, uh, and the, the reason you would want that is uh, because you you would want something like just this black and white answer. And I think it's important for us to know that like these problems are complicated and things need to be hybridized and we need to see things as tools. Cool. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good insights from both of you. Thank you. Um, so Alyssa Nicole asks, difficulties like scope are not unique to JS, though, right? I think this is pointed to you, Ashley. Cool. Um, yeah, that's totally the case. Scope is difficult for beginners in general. Um, I think uh, because of I, I think there's a couple of like kind of specific things about how scope in JavaScript works. Uh, that makes it a little bit harder for beginners. Um, it's in JavaScript. It's not as easy to make little boxes that things can't go in and out of. Basically, is how I like to describe it. When you think about scopes, is you want a box and like this is in here and then this is out here. Um, in JavaScript, that's a little bit more confusing with closures. I think that's something that people really don't have, like don't enjoy. Uh, in languages like Ruby, again, scope is very difficult, but you have like a class. And that's like a nice box. You can create namespaces in a simple way, and you don't have to necessarily use functions to do that. Mixing, like, the fact that functions are one of the ways that we control scope um, 
is, I think, what makes scope in JavaScript particularly hard for beginners, because functions are already something that's difficult for them. I wonder if maybe some of that has to do with familiarity, though. Um, like, if you've learned another language first um, and, and learned how they manage scope, and then maybe it makes it more difficult in JavaScript. But if you learn JavaScript first and learn how JavaScript manages scope, I don't know. I, I learned uh, JavaScript. I think I think it's yes and no. Like, certainly if you're coming from another language and then you're asking about JavaScript and you're like, oh, wait, this seems harder. Uh, but I do, I do think still, like, the desire to just have a box to put stuff in um, and that box ends up needing to be a function is confusing for people who have still never even programmed before because they want it to be, like, a not moving part and it ends up being a moving part. I think, I think one of the things that plays into that, just real briefly, is that... Um, we have to go back again to the previous episode when Brendan reminded us all that JavaScript came from Scheme. It really is Scheme in a procedural facade stuck inside of the browser. And if you think about a functional programming language, that notion of boxes of scope is all over the language. So if you've learned Lisp, you already have an instinctual concept of that. But if you came from a purely procedural language, you're not used to thinking about these notions of closure, variables outside of functions, functions being passed around as values. So what JavaScript asks you to do is learn functional programming without realizing that you're doing so. It asks you to learn it in the facade of a procedural language. And I think maybe that might be one of the places where a functional programmer has a leg up. It's because if they come to the language with that intuition, Scope in JavaScript makes not terribly dissimilar sense, but if you don't have that prior to coming to JavaScript, it can be a little bit weird. Yeah, completely agree. Um, Are you so, on? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so the, the next question that we have here is um, from... Oh, I lost it. Uh, oh. No, sorry. These are just a bunch of troll questions from Jeff Walfley, so we're going to move on. <laughs> so um, I think that that's good for our questions. Um, we are a little bit over time, so I, I do still want to get to the tips and picks, though, because we have some really good ones. So let's go ahead, and um, Ashley, we'll let you go last. Um, we'll start with Lynn Clark. What do you have? Uh, I'm glad that you started with me because everything that people were touching on before the questions was exactly my tips and picks section. Um, so my tip was um, about ESLint uh, because uh, some places, I was at a place before uh, Firefox DevTools, uh, I was on the Firefox DevTools team where um, there was actually a big fight about whether or not to have code style, whether or not to have ESLint. Um, at all, not even the rules. Um, and uh, I think that it's important to realize that for beginners, that stuff is really important. Um, because when you're a beginner, every difference that you see, you think it, that difference is meaningful. You don't see it as three different ways of doing the same thing. You see it as doing three different things. And so it does add to that cognitive load that Kyle was talking about. Um, so my uh, tip for this week is definitely if you are working on a project with any other people, uh, definitely use ESLint or uh, JSLint or JSHint, one of those. Um, and so use it. Uh, second, if you are converting a big code base like we're doing right now, Firefox um, DevTools and Firefox generally um, is converting to using ESLint right now. Um, and it can be tricky to introduce code style to a project when it's already so big. Um, I've done this before on another open source project, and the way we managed it there was by um, doing it file by file so that you don't have, you know, if you do um, one rule across the whole fi uh, code base um, as a patch, then it will conflict with a whole bunch of other patches that are currently being worked on by other people. If you do it file by file, you might inconvenience a couple of people who have patches that touch that file but it'll be a lot easier for them even when they are um, doing a rebase to figure out, you know, they just have one file that they need to go through and remember what they were doing in that file. Um, and my third ESLint uh, tip is um, look for plugins for, you know, if you're using React, uh, there are React, there's a React um, ESLint plugin that um, helps out with specific rules for that framework. Uh, and you can even build your own. We have one for Mozilla. Uh, so those are my tips about ESLint. Um, my pick, uh, 
uh, is about what to learn next um, and how to dive deeper once you have gotten past that beginner stage of learning JavaScript. Um, I actually uh, have been reading a lot over the past year. I read, uh, I think, almost all of the You Don't Know JS books over the past year. Um, they're a really great uh, way to get a deeper understanding of JavaScript. I actually come from, you know, um, Java, C, C++ I learned in school. Um, PHP uh, is what I have used more in open source projects. and um, So JavaScript I was newer to um, than those other languages. So uh, those books really helped me uh, jump forward immensely. Um, and also uh, Nicholas Zakis' Understanding ES6 was another great one. Um, and I was actually reading that one as I was interviewing for my current job, and uh, there were a couple of questions where I knew, like, well, actually, the spec does this, 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 because I'd read that book, like, a week before my interview. So if you are trying to get a deeper understanding or if you're interviewing, I'd recommend reading those books. Solid tips. Awesome. Um, Matt, why don't we have you go first, or go next? Okay. Uh, me and Lynn were actually on the same wavelength as far as tips. I will recommend uh, ESLint as well. Uh, I actually just added this to an open source project that I'm working on yesterday uh, because I was getting all these PRs, like everybody was using different styles and stuff, and kind of going back to what we talked about earlier, um, to have better readability of code when it's like consistent, that's just way more readable for either other people coming in on the project, but even for myself, and I look at stuff, it's like, what is this doing here? Um, so I'm kind of echoing what Lynn said, but I 100% plus won that. Um, as far as picks, I have something not tech related. Uh, I'm a big Foo Fighters fan. They just uh, released an EP on iTunes for free yesterday uh, called St. Cecilia. Um, Dave Grohl's a legend. Go check it out. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Um, uh, let's see. Brian, why don't you go next? Sure. Uh, let's see. I have um, – I was my tips – <laughs> where uh, that um, I, I found that most people I know that uh, have been programming for a very long time started with procedural until they got a good handle on it and then they felt the pain and then started with object oriented after that after they became a good intermediate programmer with that they started to really uh, you know learn the design patterns uh, gang of four kind of stuff and classes and everything and then once they saw that then they started learning you know functional programming um, you know from a and, you know, more of a slim and different style, of, you know, handling these problems. So then uh, I think this natural progression of starting procedural then learning object-oriented is a smart way to go because you're going to learn what the industry is using for the most part and then everybody's starting to kind of move functional because it's interesting and new, I guess, sometimes. But I find people reading my mostly ad adequate guide and I'm like, don't do, don't do this unless you already know object-oriented programming because, you know, you're not going to you know, walk into the next job using this stuff. Um, and then uh, I just wanted to say there was some cool picks. I don't know if they're links or picks, but uh, I have some links to uh, Jared Tobin's uh, Recursive Types. Uh, he talks about um, the fixed point, uh, you know, fix and free and co-free. And then uh, Hardy Jones's Computational Effects. Um, I've linked to that. It's a really great uh, GitHub repo to get an understanding of uh, the composability of this stuff. Cool, thanks. Good tips uh, and picks. Uh, so I'll go ahead and go next, and then we'll go with Kyle and Ashley. So um, I have one twi uh, one tip: contribute to open source. Um, you'll you just learn a ton when you contribute to other people's code. Uh, and so I have a uh, I've been asked many times, you know, what project should I contribute to? You tell me to contribute. What what should I contribute to? And so I have a blog post that answers that question. Um, and I'll, I'll add a link to that. Um, what open source project should I contribute to um, in the show notes? And then my picks, I pick slides.com. I totally love slides. Um, it's just like I don't want to have to worry about setting up my slides or, or anything. Just like give me a place to put stuff. Um, and it looks really slick. So um, slides.com and then to do MVC. I use to do MVC. Like, I know there's been a little bit of hate on to do MVC just because it's it's a really small application. It really doesn't show you all the awesome benefits of these different frameworks and, and how they compare necessarily. Um, but it's a fantastic place to uh, to start, I think. And so, um, and I use it for some of my workshops. And so, I think to do MVC is really cool. Kyle, what do you have for us? Uh, my first tip would be uh, if you are looking for a way to motivate yourself to learn try to look in your immediate vicinity, like for example where you are at work and uh, 
Look for those opportunities. If you want to learn something like a new plugin or a framework, then say, go to your boss and say, hey, um, can I do a brown bag lunch next month? about this thing and I'll spend the next month learning it and then I want to turn around and teach other people so if you're looking for ways to motivate yourself set yourself up external uh, deadlines goals if you will whether that's giving a talk or whatever uh, or a date that you have to have a blog post published even uh, set yourself up those external deadlines and that will help motivate you towards deeper learning <clears throat> the other tip that I would give is um, I personally have had as we've drawn towards the end of the year and I've had uh, a crazy year of travel and busyness as, uh, as usual. I've been experiencing a little bit of burnout recently and um, a couple of weeks ago I was like, you know what, I'm just not going to tweet anymore for a while and I'm just going to start working on building a game because I'm kind of tired of this grind of stuff and um, I just want to give that as a tip. It's okay to literally unplug and do something stupid and silly and kind of recover some of your, uh, your mental um, direction and that sort of thing. So. Uh, that would be my other tick. A couple of quick um, picks to mention. Um, David Nolan, who is um, kind of my hero, I, I listen to and read almost everything that he does. He's uh, swatted at on Twitter. He is really, really smart and fantastic. He works for Cognitech, and he was just uh, just did a podcast episode for them, their most recent one, episode 93. And he, um, I only got about halfway through this podcast before I realized I got to go back and re-listen to this thing about five times. But he was talking about. Um, um, how his framework in Clojure and Clojure Script called OM really changes the way people think about state and management of state, both front end and back end. I was blown away by it. I thought that was really fantastic. Um, another quick pick is um, some of you may have seen Blissful JS before. Um, that came out from Leah Veru. Blissful JS is basically like a jQuery Lite. It gives you a selection, but it doesn't wrap too much on top of the elements. Uh, it's a nice way of having um, some helpers along with vanilla JavaScript. And finally, a shout out to myself. Uh, finally, after way, way too long, um, the final book in my series, the You Don't Know JS series, the ES6 and Beyond book, uh, finally went to print this week. Uh, so that should be on shelves within a few weeks, maybe right after the first of the year. Uh, so check out ES6 and Beyond if you want to learn about JavaScript and where it's headed. Awesome. Congratulations. Now we need ES2016 and beyond, so get on it. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, Ashley, what do you have for us? All right. Um, so, uh, to start off, one of the, the things that I want to say kind of as a tip that's been great for me is uh, last year my, my resolution was to have more sustainable behaviors. Um, I, I often do things like in huge bursts, but I wanted to be able to do things like more sustainably. And one of the things that I started doing was this thing called Breakfast Repo. Uh, it's now my most popular GitHub repo, which is hilarious. Uh, but basically, it's a, a, a series of videos that people file as issues. And I watch one every morning with my coffee. And it's been amazing. And I've been able just to learn so much. Um, just by like doing like 20 minutes every day of like watching uh, a video, and it's not necessarily all about programming. There's a lot of programming stuff in there, um, but that's been really good. Uh, for my two tips, uh, I what I've written here is uh, to investigate the programming languages that you use as tools. Don't just take them for granted. Um, investigate them as tools. Figure out what makes them what they are. Uh, I know a, a common interview question is, what's your, your favorite thing about your, the language you use? What's the least favorite thing? Um, figure out what those are. Figure out what the trade-offs with the language that you use are. Um, I think it, it tends to be very illuminating. And then secondly, uh, I said learn about different programming paradigms and then spend some time translating your side projects into them. One of my uh, favorite exercises and that I find is probably the the way I learn the fastest is to take something that I've already done and then either translate it into another language, um, translate it into a different paradigm, uh, going from something that I understand and then moving it to a new thing uh, tends to be really successful. And so with my picks, these four kind of like focus on those two tips. Um, so the first is something called JavaScript en uh, I don't know if any of y'all have, have checked that out. Um, but it's a it's a an intro, it's really JavaScript for beginners in theory. I think it's a little bit more advanced, but it focuses uh, very much on the the functional paradigm. And so even if you think you already know JavaScript, it's a it's a really great way to go back in there and like try and see JavaScript from a different angle if it's an angle that you're not using. Um, additionally, it's also just like a great review of some some good functional practices. 
then there's this uh, uh, blog post called Hello Declarative World. Uh, it's a blog post based on a talk that uh, somebody gave. And basically, it's, it's written in Ruby, uh, but it's talking about different programming paradigms, um, what the declarative paradigm is all about, and then it actually implements what's called a relational declarative language in Ruby. And I will throw up the link. I went through and translated it into ES6. Uh, it was really cool. If In particular, it uses generators. So if you thought generators were cool and need a project to like actually use them, this was like a very fun uh, example of that. And then last two are two talks, which I would recommend that you watch together. Uh, and I'm only going to just say their names uh, and tell you nothing about them because I feel like I would ru I'd ruin the kind of surprise in both. Uh, one is Simple Made It Easy by Rich Hickey, and the other is Growing a Language by Guy Steele. Um, they're both fantastic. The Guy Steele one is old, but it's amazing. Um, and again, both focus on, on language design. Awesome. If you're listening and not watching, um, then just know that a ton of people just nodded their heads real big like this. Uh, <laughs> Simple Made Easy is a very good talk, and I highly recommend you watch it regularly, like rewatch. Um, oh yeah, of all the time. So good. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay, so we are a little bit over, so I apologize to anybody who had other uh, commitments after this, but I think this was a fantastic show, and um, these tips and picks were super solid. So check them out. Um, before we wrap things up, I just have a couple of closing announcements. So if you have suggestions for us, go to suggest.javascriptair.com, and there you can suggest uh, topics and guests. Uh, we fuel our podcast with your suggestions. It's really helpful. Um, and if you have feedback for us, go to feedback.javascriptair.com and uh, submit feedback. We appreciate that. Um, we do respond to, um, you know, or we do things based off of your feedback, so it's helpful. And then uh, remember that next week's show is um, with the Babel team, and we're going to be talking about uh, Babel, the JavaScript transpiler. So it'll be the same time, same place next week, um, and it should be fantastic. And as always, follow us on Twitter and Google+, and Facebook to keep up with the latest. So that's our show. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. Really appreciate you, Ashley, especially, for coming on, and Kyle, um, always appreciate you. Thank you. Well, we'll see you all uh, next week. Bye. See you next week. Bye. Bye.